and we are recording. All yours, Andra. Thanks. Okay, great. Welcome, everyone. Laura will be here shortly, but we're going to start because we have quorum. Um, so um, let's um, start with the. Should we start with the minutes? There's no. Oh, there is one public. We do need a minute taker. Oh yes, our minute taker. Where? What's our? Let's see. Last time is Dwayne. So next mm -hmm. on the list is Jesse. Yes. Oh. Are we just going down the list? Yes, and Jesse's so. not here yet. Okay. Then we we'll skip to Steve. Oh, get on it. <laughs> I'm just going on the the list of committee members that we have in our minutes, going down in order because seems like that's how we're doing it. All right, I'm taking um, minutes. So, so under control. So Steve's going to take the minutes, and now we will um, we'll want to take a. a moment to remember your notes that you wrote to update the minutes from the last meeting, if any. I had some comments on the minutes if it's time for that yet. Yes, go ahead. Um, there were just two things. Um, one is that block power, which is spelled with two words in the minutes, I believe is just block, B-L-O-C, power with a capital P, one word. That's right. Um, and there was one place that I sent to Stephanie where the word done was incorrectly transcribed as down. So, um, okay. minor stuff. Stephanie, you have those changes? I will make a note, yes, and make those amendments. Any other edits needed? If there's nothing else, I'll make the motion to accept the minutes. Second it. Okay. Stephanie. Lori, was that you seconding? I'm sorry. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, then I will do a voice vote in no particular order. Allison? You have to unmute. Sorry, you have to unmute, Don. You have to hear that. I abstain since I wasn't here. Okay. Um, Goldner? Yes. Roof? Yes. Raghavan? Yes. Breger? Yes. D? Yes. Rose? Yes. Okay. Minutes are approved as amended. Great. Thank you. Okay, so um, we do have um, one attendee. Um, oh, it's Anna. Um, shall we um, see if Anna has a report for us? No, that's probably not the next thing on the list. Let's see. Well, it's not public comment for Anna to speak. I don't think, I think we moved to public comment because this is essentially a pre-retreat meeting. Awesome. So yeah. we changed it up a little bit. So the public yeah, comment okay. is being held to the end. Let me just get that up then. I have town council liaison update is the second item anyway, right? Thank so. you. Yes. So I will yep. allow so, Anna to talk. Hi, everybody. Hi, Anna. Hi. Hi, Anna. Happy Wednesday. Hi. Hi. Um, so just a couple of things, mostly continuations. I know I threw a lot at you last uh, last meeting, so hopefully I will not always have so many things to throw at you. But um, today, Stephanie and Laura, I believe, received a note about the rental registration bylaw. Um, so the Community Resources Committee, which is chaired by Mandy Joe, is taking up that um, rental registration bylaw essentially to replace what we currently have. And so they um, they have developed a work plan for how they're going to go through it. 
Um, and one of the things I was at the meeting and I, um, uh, I encouraged them to specifically add you all to their list on the work plan. Uh, they were, they were talking about doing sustainability implications as an internal discussion. And I was like, well, hang on, we actually have a, a whole group of people that, that, uh, does this. So, um, they have added you all to their work plan. So for better or for worse, you are now involved in that process. Um, and so what I believe that they have, uh, proposed and Stephanie, please feel free to correct me if you have a different understanding, um, is that they would love Stephanie to attend, uh, one of the meetings on March. Nope. That's that already happened. One of the future meetings, sorry, I don't have the date in front of me, uh, that is specifically about sustainability implications uh, of a rental registration bylaw. And I guess it's less implications, it's more opportunities, right? So it's more about what, what are the opportunities in this to move forward some of the different elements in the, in the CARP plan. Um, and that is, uh, I can pull it up. It is Thursday, April, hang on, I got it, I got it. Uh, nope, it just says April. That's not helpful. Sorry, y'all. So um, they, she will be working with Stephanie and I believe Laura on kind of when that's going to happen. Um, and so I, I know Stephanie distributed that bylaw to you all um, to look over. So I don't know if that's something that you're discussing or however you plan on handling that, that's fine. But also just to keep an eye on other areas that you might think that you believe ECAC should be invited uh, to contribute on. Similarly, the uh, demolition delay bylaw is also in front of um, CRC right now. They, um, they have been discussing it. The version that Stephanie sent, just so you know, is already really changing. So um, please feel free to, again, however you decide to handle it. I think the, from my, my vantage point, the most efficient use of time would be for you all to send edits or suggestions to Mandy. Um, and then what would be really helpful is if, and this is not an obligation at all, but if you just let me know when you've done that so that I can kind of chase, chase her down or whatever needs to happen. Um, but if, if I'm out of the loop, it's, it's a little bit harder for me to support that. Um, I think that that's, I think that's it from my end, unless you all really want to know about sewer and water regulations. Um, mm. yeah, that's, I think that's kind of, that's it from, from my are there any questions for Anna? If anyone has questions for me, happy to. I do have one. Yeah. Um, Anna, in terms of um, getting feedback, would it be easier for the ECAC um, to send comments to me to collect them all in one response package to Mandy Joe rather than individuals reaching out yes. at separate times? Please, please, please do that. Um, I think that would not only be just generally easier, but also would kind of solidify you all as a, as a, as one voice versus random input. So I'm sure Laura will want to add this to an agenda. And I know she's already reached out to Steve. Steve, I don't know if you wanted to weigh in or say anything about that. I, I just saw the message that she sent about an hour ago. Um, so I'm happy to weigh in to some degree. Great. I think um, it would be important, Steve, for you to um, introduce the idea that um, we've been working on, right, to have rentals be more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing that's that I know you all do know about is the um, Solar Bylaw Working Group is looking for people. I know that Stephanie and Laura are going to talk to you about ECAC representation, but we are also looking for two resident spots. So if you could spread the word on that, it would be hugely helpful. Um, we'd love to get some knowledgeable uh, folks in those seats. So please, uh, yeah, feel free to share the, share the information on that. It's all on the, it should all be on the town website. Um, and then the only last thing is that we are heading into budget season. So um, the, this obviously does have some implications for you all. Uh, although I believe Stephanie, most of the things you all look for are in the capital, the JCPC, the capital budget. Um, so if you would like to, I'm happy to send Stephanie an overview of kind of where, when the process is playing out. Um, the finance committee sees different parts of it at different times, and then it comes all before the, the council um, throughout the month of May. So if you are interested in more details, I'm happy to give that, but it's something where I think 
uh, we want to keep an eye on the again implications of the budget on how we're moving forward in the in the CARP plan and things like that. I think that's everything. Does anyone have any question, any other questions for me or anything you would like to see me doing? I'm sure we'll have other things that we'd like to see you doing <laughs> as we go on with our agenda, Anna. That sounds good. And just as a reminder, I do have to leave early, but I do look back at the minutes. And so if I miss something that you want me to do, either let me know or put it in the minutes or however you want to send the bat signal, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you all so much for, for all your work. I appreciate it. I do think that, um, Steve, if you can get in the, the notes, um, we do want to have a conversation about if there's anything else um, around our charges, around how to um, move the CARP forward through this um, rental bylaw uh, work, besides what we've already started working on. Um, there may be other opportunities here. Yeah, absolutely. I'm hoping that if, if there are, that's something that would be really helpful for you all to put in that memo or whatever it is that you draft to Mandy Jo. Um, they really are kind of building this thing up from the ground. So it's a, it's a very good opportunity um, to move. Yeah. The, um, the uh, timing. We've... Yeah. Um, the timing of it is, hang on, let me pull up my little, my little sheet again, sorry. So they are hoping to speak with you all in April. Um, they're going to have um, the, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of this. All right, so they're talking with you all at some point in April, they're talking through goals for the revisions, a general discussion on that. Uh, and the types of licensing and things like that throughout April. In May, they're gonna reach out to the Board of License Commissioners because there's so many different aspects of rental registration. Some of them are truly regulation and, and licensing. Um, and then they're going to have start to have public input in late May. They're also going to then go into uh, application processes and requirements. So again, this would be another place for where they have, they have stated inviting um, the chair of ECAC and the sustainability coordinator to that meeting on May 26th. Uh, there will also be public comment there, but just so you all know, um, in meetings where you all are invited as ECAC, this is, I'm gonna inject a little personal opinion. Uh, you should not be in public comment for adding your input. That should be something that is held for you all on the agenda. So because ECAC chair is uh, listed on the agenda, however you all decide to speak, um, that should be part of the meeting, not public comment, because we don't want to lose your comment in general public comment. Mm -hmm. um, in June, they start talking through the application process, the fee authority, the transfer of licenses, et cetera. And then um, in late June, they start talking through inspections. Um, I don't know if there's anything there that might impact you all, but um, as you go through. And then in July, they start, they wrap up inspections and um, and start in on violations. This is thrilling stuff, I know. Uh, <laughs> violations continue, talking through violations in August. Um, okay. And then they get into the definitions and purposes. It's really, truly, just so you know, this isn't done till December. Um, yeah. So this is a long, I won't, I won't keep going, but basically... Um, this is a long, long process. Um, this is something that was sent. Stephanie, do you have this? Uh, do you want me to send it? Um, if you want to send it, that would be great. Sure. Yeah. I, um, do you want me to send it to the group or just to you? Send it to me and I'll make sure it gets out to the group. Great. Yeah. Um, so this is in public record. This was something CRC discussed. So it's not, this isn't a secret. Okay. Um, and there's lots of, because nothing, nothing we do in government is really a secret. Um, so the, uh, yeah, so that is okay. I just happening. want to get a sense of whether yep. having yeah. an input yeah. this Definitely. month is necessary because I think we might run out of meetings. I will say this month is the one I, I truly think that a general input this month on areas that you like, if you look at that and say, here are the future areas where you should be talking to us, um, mm -hmm. whether it's inspections, whether it's registration. That's in my mind what would be helpful to do this month more than anything else. Does that make sense? So there, it might be necessary for um, some 
proposals through the um, buildings ex electrification accelerator group first and, and, and then maybe bring that to ECAC sooner than later. Yeah, I think it, it needs to go to you all sooner than later because essentially what you're saying now is here's where we need to be consulted as you build this. Right. Um, that's, that's the important, it doesn't necessarily need to be the exact specific things right now, but, um, Great. yeah. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Um, yeah. So Laura is here, Laura, we've done the first two, um, items on the, uh, meeting agenda. Do you want to take over? You can. Great. Thanks, Andra. I'm sorry. I'm, I was late. Um, Okay, so I guess I'll turn it actually over to Stephanie maybe for the vote on appointment to the Solar Bylaw Working Group. You want sure. to do staff updates first? <clears throat> we don't have uh, that on the agenda this time. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, if I'm if anybody has anything quick they want to add, feel, Steve, did you have something burning to? No. Okay. I was just going by last month's template. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, just real quick, Laura, I noticed that uh, Hadley's having a climate day on the 23rd of April. It's going to be a day long 10 to 4 event. They're bringing in a panel of experts. They have workshops and some exhibits as well. So it's going to be held at the Hadley Senior Center and Hadley Public Library Complex. And it does require registration because it's going to be limited since it's indoors. I'm not sure. Uh, it, it is. Yeah. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Dwayne? Hey, yeah. Just remind, and sorry, I, I, this will be real quick because uh, we want to get on, but uh, it did remind me, I did was approached by, approached by a student group who was interested in potentially uh, some activity with the town on Earth Day. And I was like scratching my head trying to remember if... Um, there was going to be any like Earth Day celebration in Amherst or whether it was on uh, COVID lockdown still um, for that. We're not having a, the town is not sponsoring an event this year. Yeah, exactly. Because we are still on COVID. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say because of COVID, but go ahead, Stella. Oh, yeah. I was just in an Arboretum, <clears throat> UMass Arboretum Committee meeting this morning and UMass is definitely doing stuff uh, yeah, that, as well yeah. as yep. multiple like Arbor Day stuff spread okay. out over the second two weeks of April. I think the Earth Day stuff is going to be kind of tied in and all um, getting okay. pinned down over the next week or so. There is one Earth Day event that's going to be um, a flash mob Earth Day <laughs> dance on um, uh, during the farmer's market. 11 o'clock oh. on the 23rd, first day of the farmer's market. That didn't come into my uh, feed yet. Okay. <laughs> Dwayne, you better be there. Yeah. <laughs> Anna has her hand up. It's uh, Mothers Out Front and uh, uh, XR Western Mass and uh, Climate Action Now and Amherst Sunrise doing that. Yeah. Anna, did you have something to add? I did, sorry. Um, on April 30th, we are doing community cleanups across town. Uh, oh, it's not necessarily okay. specifically an Earth Day thing, but there, um, if you go to, I believe it's on engageamherst.org, uh, you can sign up for different spots. I will be at Groff Park if you wanna come hang out. Um, but they're also doing it at Mill River and um, starting at the Jones Library. So that it's not necessarily an Earth Day event, but I think that they are trying to, yeah, community cleanup um, Saturday, April 30th, 10 to 10 to one, um, 10 to 12, sorry. So you can sign up for that. Feel free to spread the word. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, Stephanie. Sure. So the, um, I sent everybody, I forwarded you the email from the town manager, um, that he has finalized the charge for the solar bylaw working group, and he's requesting, um, representation from the five, I believe five committees, <clears throat> ECAC being one, someone from the planning board, front, someone from the conservation commission, someone from the um, 
Board of Health, and then also someone from the, um, uh, I'm sorry, I always forget their name, but they're the Water Protection Supply Committee, a water, su water supply protection committee. Um, in any case, <clears throat> there would be five uh, representatives, representatives appointed, one from each of those committees. And so tonight you have all been asked to um, either nominate someone, volunteer yourself, but then have a vote as to who would be the person to represent the ECAC on the solar bylaw working group. I will also note that you all will be part of the review process. So even if you're not going to be on that, you know, as part of that working group, your liaison will be bringing back information, getting feedback from you. And certainly there'll be drafts of documents for you to review and weigh in on. So as a committee. So um, I just wanted to note that. So I guess I would ask, does someone want to nominate someone or does someone want to nominate themselves? It, we've talked about it a couple of times and it seems to me it makes most sense for Dwayne to be our representative, um, but uh, Steve's also worked on it, so. I, I'm, uh, I'll throw my hat in the ring uh, and say I'm, I'm willing and able, um, and, and I hope capable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, but obviously, um, uh, welcome other nominations as well. Um, what I would say is that I, I'd be excited to, to uh, represent ECAC and and um, be diligent in reaching out uh, to everybody on the committee and, and in these meet in, in the ECAC meetings to, to uh, go over what we're we're working on and decisions that have to be made. Um, I, I would view it as being representing ECAC, not not myself. So, uh, and uh, I know there's other people on this committee that would have a lot to um, offer uh, in that regard. Uh, so I'd be really um, keen on, on that. Um, I will say I, I, I'm, I'm not a uh, zoning expert, but I've read zoning, uh, solar zoning bylaws and have sort of look, looked at, um, um, worked uh, with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission on some surveys of, of zoning bylaws. So I'm familiar to some degree on, 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 on the uh, issues that come up. Um, and, you know, just from my current work and my DOER days, I know, my, I know how to um, language that goes into regulation. So I think there's some similarities there with zoning language as well. Uh, but I'm also keen on other people's um, other um, nominations um, as well. I'll note too that you also don't need to be an expert on zoning bylaws to be part of oh, this good. working group because <laughs> we, you know, the committee will be working or the group working group will also be working very closely with the planning board. Yeah. So a lot of that input is going to come from them. So you all won't be asked to be creating something out of the blue. We're actually going to be bringing a draft that's sort of um, started by the you know, the planning board will be the draft that would come to the, to the working group and the working group would sort of go from there. So it's not like you're creating everything out of the ether. You're gonna have um, documents and um, to, to start great. from and work from. Yeah, great, great. And also I will note that this will probably be a bi-weekly meeting. Bi-weekly. Uh, are we trying to remember that? That's every other week? Every other week, yes. As long as, it, as, long as it's not Wednesday at 4.30. I, it, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, well, it wouldn't, that wouldn't work for me either. Yeah. So, uh, and so you'll be happen. on that as well, Stephanie? Yes. I'm, I'm actually, I'm, yeah, I'm, uh, Chris Prestrup and I, the planning director and I are the two staff members that are basically right. overseeing this whole thing yeah. moving forward. So, um, so anyone else then? I know, Steve, your name was mentioned. I'm, I'm interested, um, but I had a, a, that was one question about the frequency of the meetings. Um, and previously, when it was thought that the solar study aspect was going to be charged with this committee to this committee, there was going to be some alternate weekly meetings for some on that committee. So, can you say, Stephanie, where the solar study is going to be done? It, it's going to be part of that process um, because that what's going to happen is that that information will be 
fed to that committee. Um, what might happen is securing the consultant to conduct that will probably happen at the staff level is what I'm being encouraged to sort of have happen. Um, again, when we write the RFP, you'll ask, you'll be certainly asked to weigh in, but that RFP may get looked at by the Solar Bylaw Working Group. But um, mm -hmm. as far as the process of like interviewing the consultant and that kind of thing, there may be a representative. I would certainly advocate for Duane being in, involved in that process. Um, even if you weren't on the solar bylaw working group. Um, but I don't think there's going to be, there, it won't be something that that committee is going to be as engaged in as developing the bylaw. So, so how much would the ECAC be involved in that developing the solar studies? Is that going to be handed over to the consultants and then we'll get a report? Or are we going to be involved in you'll You'll be in, it? you'll be, you'll have some help in shaping it. You know, it'll be, you know, similar to, it won't be exactly like the CARP, but similar to the CARP process is because I'm the one overseeing that piece. So I will be coming to you all for your input and guidance. Um, so. And then is the consultant also going to help with the community input aspects of the solar by bylaw development? Um, not beyond the assessment, and I don't know at this point, because I'm not sure if there's funding for hiring a consultant to develop the solar bylaw. Um, so the assessment is different process than the bylaw in terms of hiring a consultant. They're right. just focused on the assessment, and there will be some community engagement for that piece. I just remember how useful it was having our consultant help us with the CARP, with the community development part Correct. of that, and holding the public meetings and coordinating those and consolidating comments and outreach and advertisement and all of that. Um, if that falls to the committee members and the staff, that's gonna be a kind of a big task. There's a lot of work. Um, I, I, again, I don't know about the funding for the a consultant for the bylaw development. I would assume that there will be because I know there's been some discussion of, of that. Okay. Um, I don't know. I just don't know for certain. The only thing I am certain of is that there will be a consultant as part of the assessment. And that I know that we will be utilizing them for community engagement. Okay. okay. Yeah, I guess that was a helpful clarification on, on the zoning bylaw working group um, and, and the charge. There did seem to be a pretty um, um, important, um, but uh, robust um, um, uh, step or, or, or portion of that to uh, really get stakeholder and, and constituent input that I think was went beyond sort of just public hearings and just hearing what people have to say, but more um, targeted surveys or, or uh, judging perceptions and, and, and uh, um, preferences and so forth and, and, and uh, opinions. Um, and I guess I, um, one question I had on the on the bylaw working group is that um, is there a, is the, the this committee going to be uh, sort of doing that on on their own uh, through some some coordination or is there going to be some support from the town or maybe I'm misreading that in terms of maybe it's just sort of straightforward public hearings but it seemed like a little bit more robust process of trying to gauge um, the uh, communities. Um, preferences and interests in this? It'll definitely be community engagement um, for sure. And it's also eventually what's gonna happen is there's gonna be a draft that's going to be developed that will then go to the town council. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's basically, and then there'll be, you know, their community process as well through their um, review and discussion of the bylaw. Um, and I see um, Anna has her hand up. So I'm gonna, Anna, is that, do you have Thank a question you. now? It's a comment. Uh, oh, they okay. did apply in through the capital budget for funding specifically for a consultant for the oh, solar good. study. Okay. So that was, and that was uh, checked by JCPC. We liked that idea. Um, however, it still has to go through the full council. So it's it's in there right now. Okay. Yeah. I, I knew that there was discussion. I just didn't know it had moved forward. So yeah, it's in there. Yep. <clears throat> okay, great. So I, I envision it will be a fairly engaged process because there's so much interest. Yes. Will it be possible um, 
Stephanie to have, like, let's say Dwayne can't make a meeting. Like, is it possible for Steve to go in his place or someone else on ECAC? So we like, feel like we are consistently being represented. There's no, there's no um, official appointment of alternates, you know, for, for the committee. So I would say, you know, it's, it's not a regulatory body. You're not, you know, you're sort of developing a draft, but you're not voting on anything and making regulatory decisions. So it may be possible if, if Dwayne can't make a meeting that somebody else goes in his place. I would just, just have to double, I just need to verify that. I don't. Okay. Not that it's critical, but it's worth knowing. Is it, uh, is the expectation that these would be virtual meetings or in-person meetings? Um, oh, they'll, they'll be virtual. <laughs> For now, anyway. I mean, there is a point at which, um, depending on what happens with state law. I mean, you know, this is all based on state law, right? So if, oh. if we, it, you know, if the state lifts the um, remote meeting policy and we have to go back to adhering to the open meeting law, then, then we have to meet in person. Mm -hmm. We're obligated to. So, um, so, and that, I don't know when, um, and Anna, I can't, Recall, have you heard any update on when that potentially might happen? I can't remember the date of when it expires. Did she? It looks okay. like Anna's maybe gone. Nope. Oh, okay. Oh. oh, she's in back in the attendees list, I guess. She's been oh. there. Okay, there we go. Sorry. I had to switch over to my phone, so I lost my ability to unmute. Um, I believe it's through June or July uh, right now, and then they'll revisit at that point. Yep, I just couldn't remember what the date was. Yeah, I think so. I, I think July. <laughs> okay, so Thanks. yeah, so at least we'll be and we'll be meeting remotely until then. But at the point that the state lifts the remote, the ability to meet remotely, and we go back to the, you know, to standard open meeting law, then we are required and obligated to meet in person. It doesn't mean that um, you don't have the option of meeting remotely. It's, everybody can't do it, but if there is a member who has a specific reason, then you have to complete, and we've done this in the past, there's a, a remote request to participate and there's an application and you basically send it to me, Laura signs it, looks at it, and then a member can, can participate remotely. Um, it is a little more complicated. Um, again, it can't be more, you have to have a quorum in person. That person meeting remotely can't be the person that makes up a quorum. So um, it's not quite as easy as doing it this way that we've been doing it via Zoom. So, okay, then it sounds like, Steve, go ahead. I was just gonna um, nominate myself and say that this is something that I've been following the developments of and I'm very interested in. And I've been doing quite a bit of research on both what other communities have and, um, and as you know, also digesting what the state is, is uh, the plans from the state <clears throat> as well as other plans, other states' plans and other plans both um, done in the United States and also the, the, the plan that was just released this week. Um, so I'm very interested in this process. Um, I, a little torn, I, I would love to participate or willing to participate. I'm not sure it's gonna be a fun process entirely. I think Dwayne would be a great member. Um, I was trying to think of a way that we could sort of split some of the duties because it looks like there's two really big tasks. One is the bylaw development and then and the other is the solar assessment, um, the solar study. And I have some, I want to make sure that the questions that get asked as part of the solar study before it even gets started are, are critical questions. Um, because that, that, there are questions I think we need to ask that are probably not typically part of a solar study. And, and that's true for the bylaw development too. I, I've seen the planning board go through and have been kind of picking and choosing different elements from other communities' solar bylaws. And I think that's a start, but that's not gonna be very innovative. And that's not gonna address, I think, what we and 
progressive Amherst want to have. There are other, other aspects like I've raised about what is the amount of solar that we need. So there's, I, I feel strongly about some of these things and I'd be happy to serve on it. And this will then give us a chance to have a vote. <laughs> but if there's a way that um, one of us can be an official member and the other support or take on tasks of the solar study, I think that could be a great way to split the workload. So yeah, I don't know in terms of how that works as an official committee that's being appointed by the town manager. I don't know that you can necessarily both serve and split tasks, but you know, again, I do believe that there is a role for the ECAC and that some of the work will be coming back to the ECAC or requests for guidance or input. So as I've said numerous times, this person isn't going to be, that's not going to be the only time the ECAC has any connection or ability to influence the development of either of the assessment or the bylaw. You'll be weighing in through the whole thing. You know, at every step of the way, information will be coming back to you either through the appointed liaison or myself. So um, I just want to reassure all of you because I think, you know, others have opinions too and will want to weigh in. So I just want to be clear about that. So as it stands now, then both Roof and Breger are interested in serving on that committee. So is there anyone else? Can I? I don't know Go ahead, Don. Oh, Sorry, I, I, I missed a little button to raise my hand. Um, I, I, Stephanie, maybe you can help me out. I, I, is there an issue like for which, whichever one of the two that are now interested is chosen? There's no reason that whoever is chosen can't consult pretty intensely um, with the one who isn't chosen, um, independent of whatever comes back to us. I mean, I, I would presume that either Steve or Dwayne would want to spend some time, whoever was going to be representing us in that committee would want to spend some time with the other, um, not just coming back to us as a committee and giving us other, other chances, but I don't, I don't know why the two couldn't work together, to be honest with you. It's just that one gets to go to the committee meetings and be the mouthpiece um, for us. I agree. I'm familiar, I will, I'm familiar I agree. with being mouthpieces. That's all. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. I would also just in, really encourage public process too. You know, so it would be really helpful to have some of those conversations um, in, in public session too, because that's also how other people understand what the issues are um, and how you're sort of working that through. I think that's an important piece. So um, it's, I don't disagree that that can't happen. I'm just saying that that's also, you know, I don't personally, I think that's fine. Um, just, you know, remember about public process and transparency for others too. So any other comments? Duane, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to, before we vote, also publicly state that I think Steve would be a great candidate, great <laughs> uh, 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 mem member as well. Um, and uh, however it turns out, um, I'm happy. Uh, but also, um, I also appreciate what Don just said um, in terms of, um, you know, because I think both Steve and I have some subject matter expertise and and interest and 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 familiarity and, and specific issues that want to be addressed that, that um, um, I wish we could somehow serve to, together. Uh, but in either case, whoever is appointed, it would be great to, to work together um, in ways that may be a little bit more um, robust than, than what we can sort of just uh, on a bi-weekly bi -weekly basis uh, discuss with the committee, no, the, the ECAC committee. I would say, so this is what I would say, given some conversations I have had with the um, clerk to the council about open meeting law and, and sort of being cognizant of that. You may both have conversations if you are seeking Steve's expertise yeah. or Steve is seeking your expertise, you may do that. What we cannot do as a committee here is assign you both to that task and then you become an official subcommittee. So we cannot do that. Yeah. So. I would say that you can informally together 
whichever of you gets appointed, if you want to speak with the other one, do that informally outside of meetings, you can bring share that expertise, but you cannot work together as an appointed body. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Just two right. professors having coffee. <laughs> <laughs> that works. So okay. Basu, you had your hand up. Yeah. When do we have to make that decision? This decision on who's going to be part of the working group? Now I'm about to, I'm about to move the process. Well, I know I'm asking because uh, if we have some more time, uh, I wonder if it makes sense to do it after we all meet and we talk about, you know, CPACE and CCA and engagement, who's going to cover all that because is and who has that expertise, right? Is it Dwayne or Steve? Can they, you know, they're not going to be working on these working group and something else. You know, if, if Steve has better relationships with the community, maybe Steve is better suited for engagement, right? I, I think both are capable. I, I just think there's other things that we need to think about as well before uh, thinking about whether it's going to be Dwayne or Steve. Unfortunately, you don't have the luxury of time. <laughs> the town manager would like the um, someone within the next two weeks and would like to start moving this process forward. So the longer we wait, we can't wait for our retreat to make a decision. No, but we're about under. to just at least discuss the um, yeah. different topics. Oh, you're saying so at the end of this meeting? Yeah, I, I, yeah, that oh, was going to be my alternate suggestion. I, yeah. I thought you meant if the we retreat. can do it at the end of the meeting so we can understand everything that we need to do, our focus areas and you know, where Steve and, and... Sure, that's, that's fine. Um, Stella, did you have a comment? Yeah, um, I, I, as a relatively like new new member here, I have absolute faith in both Dwayne and Steve's subject matter expertise, and it seems like they've like spoken to that. And I, I also have some familiarity. I don't really have a horse in the race as far as like solar zoning, but I am familiar with community members who 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 do, <laughs> and and am aware of kind of some of the relational work that probably is is going to go into this. And, and I just wonder. Um, I guess I guess I just I just in in both of your little, like nomination speeches. It would, it would help to make the decision if both of you could talk uh, just briefly on on how enthusiastic you are about about that that piece of work because are, are we were voting right <laughs> we haven't no there's been no motion oh, yet voting. and in fact basu asked that we move to this vote to the end of the yeah. meeting so that you can go through some of the other um agenda items and sort of hear where they are in their knowledge base and all of that to maybe help make a decision. Yeah. I, I just wonder if the if the if if the sort of soft, for lack of a better word, I know people have issues with, but the soft <laughs> skills um piece, if we're, if that's not kind of on the agenda, that seems like it'll be a pretty important part. I okay, so I'm referring to you know. Oh. I would say that that we collectively as the ECAC can play that role. Um, and we have, you know, thought about that, how, how we might be a facilitator of the community engagement, um, in this and other topics. Yeah. So I feel it's less important. That's fair. That's a good point. That's helpful to hear. Okay. So we're going to vote on this at the end. Is that? Are folks okay with that? All right. Okay, so let's um, move forward with our pre-retreat agenda items here. Um, so I, um, I think we can. Uh, what I'm going to suggest is that we each go through our topics. Um, and I'd like what I'd like to do if anybody has talking points or slides or anything that they're using. We'll pull them all together into like one doc that we can share with everybody ahead of the retreat because I know we have a, quite a bit of time between now and our retreat. So um, you know we kind of have all the materials. So if you if you have talking points about your topic that you're gonna read out or whatever, um, like just share them with me and Stephanie at the end, and we'll compile them all into one one document if that if that works for folks. Um, and since we have a lot to go through, I think we'll just leave 
questions as clarifying questions for now and then you know jot down any questions you have and we'll spend some time at the start of the retreat like making sure everybody's feels comfortable um with everything but the point of this is just to like level set make sure we're all on the same page of what the charge of, of ECAC is the process we went through for the CARP um and sort of some of our ideas around organization and then some key initiatives that we've been working on um, so with that, uh, Stephanie, I think I sent through some slides to Stephanie that just lay out the elements of the charge um, that I, we can go through quickly. Um, yep. Thanks, Stephanie. Just give me a moment. This. Sorry, I'm just gonna get this going. Sorry. Okay, so I just need to get to the beginning. Okay, Laura. Thanks. So these are not pretty slides, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you can go to the next slide, please, Stephanie. Oh. All right, why is this not advancing? There we go. Okay, so um, you everyone can read our charge on the website. There's a link here, but really the purpose that's identified for our committee is to guide the town in meeting its climate mitigation and resiliency goals. And there were sort of three or six elements listed under that. Um, recommend goals, recommend, um, like sort of re recommend a plan and prioritization for efforts to, to reduce our emissions and build climate resiliency. Um, these first two are kind of both goals. Um, and it could one's long-term and one's medium-term. And so we've, we've kind of done all the, all three of these, the first two we did in our first year where we got the town to adopt our targets, which if I remember correctly are 25% reduction by 2025 um, 50% by 2030 and then uh, full decarbonization or zero, I forget the wording we actually use, but um, by 2050, if not earlier. And those are aligned with sort of what the IPCC and the science says we need to do globally to reduce, to have a best shot at, at limiting ourselves to the, from the worst impacts of climate change. So I think we've accomplished these three these three things. Um, and then there are three more things in our charge that we're still working on, which are on the next couple of slides. Sorry, I don't know, there we go. Um, I think four, we've also done a bit of, done a significant amount of through our CARP, um, which is recommends programs and policies. I think we all agree that there's more granularity and, you know, detail that need that's needed on all of those and so that's part of the our future work um there's a point made in the charge that we sh we should propose as necessary to either the council or the manager different ways that um implementation could happen around the carp and our climate plan um and these are some of the items that are listed there next slide please and then finally, um, promote a holistic and an intersectional approach to climate action, which, and the points listed here involve working with other committees and other bodies, um, coordinating both with other committees, but also with businesses and re residents, um, engaging in education, working with a town manager, um, to solicit feedback from impacted town departments, a lot of which we've already, we've done, we've started doing with um, the CARP development and Stephanie continues to do in her role. Um, this says working with the town manager, what it really means is working with Stephanie, um, <laughs> serving as a resource as appropriate to town staff on climate action goals and strategies. So next slide, please. I, um, so I just wanted, and then finally, um, this is a report, the last part of our charge, outlines that we should write a report annually that includes the following elements and we just submitted our report 
last month, I believe, um, here. So, so next slide. So like I said, I'll share this all with you in, in kind of a packet of information for the retreat, but I wanted to, to have all this in one place for us to look, look at and go back to, because I think it lays out a couple of avenues that we can take. Um, and I think what I hope we can do in the retreat is really think about what are the best ways to accomplish our purpose, which is guiding the town and meeting our goals. Um, you know, what work should we be doing as ECAC versus work we need to ask of town staff, council or other committees to be doing. Um, and I think, although applying the climate lens is not specifically in our charge, this is a terminology that comes up a lot. Um, and I think, I'd like to, to dig into sort of how we effectively apply, apply that to decisions like budgeting and project development. Um, you know, the IPCC, the most recent IPCC report came out this week and it just hammers home that we have got to get off fossil fuels yesterday. And so it just continues to make me think about what our role can be and really ensuring that the town is not investing any more resources into fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, you know, and how do we help the town do that? Not just the town government, but you know, the rest of the town community. Um, so that that's it for me in terms of my overview of the charge. Unless there's any clarifications, we can move on to uh, Stephanie. Okay, great. It's really helpful to have that outline, Laura. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll share it with everybody at the end. Stephanie, are you pulling up something? Oh, I can't hear you. You're not muted, but. I am muted, sorry. Well, oh, okay. I was muted on my headset, sorry. Um, yes, I am pulling up something, so just bear okay. with me one second. I'm sorry, I'm having some technical challenges here. All right, I'll just do it this way. All right. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna actually just give a, more of a, an overview of climate action and I'm not gonna to delve too much into the climate action plan because um, I know everyone's received it and I'm just gonna sort of talk about the, quickly I'll talk about the history of how we got here, but basically we've been looking at addressing climate change since the early 2000s. You know, in 2001, we came up with a greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Um, we had a student, uh, fellow work on that one summer. And then by 2005, we developed a climate action plan. Um, that climate action plan was developed with very little engagement with the community. Uh, there was initially a um, an energy task force group that consisted of roughly 20 people at the beginning. And by the time we got to developing the climate action plan, I think we were down to five people. So there wasn't a lot of... Um, there wasn't a lot of engagement. There also wasn't a lot of buy-in or really support for that process, to be honest. So um, even though it focused very much on the um, municipality and the three institutions of higher education in town, um, a lot of things that were proposed were things that that happened and were being done. But you know, as we all know, over time, things change, technology changes, goals change. And so that plan is really, at this point, both the inventory and the plan were heavily outdated um, and not really so relevant and there wasn't buy-in as I said. So in 2012, we really shifted our focus um, when the Green Communities Program was launched in the state. We really decided to sort of shift our focus to um, instead of just focusing on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, just really trying to focus on energy efficiency as kind of a win-win a approach to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by focusing on the energy efficiency and um, becoming a green community, it allowed us to, to um, 
have access to funding that we otherwise wouldn't have to do some of these efficiency projects. The very first one that we did was a lighting retrofit um, of all the street lights in town from that the town owned from high pressure sodium to LED uh, street lights. Uh, that was a very significant project and um, had you know had some quantifiable um, impacts for the town. So green communities was kind of our our you know, our shift in focus. But then as we move forward with even that process, it was sort of getting to the point where it was really obvious that we needed to do more and we needed more community engagement and community buy-in and really involvement and engagement and buy-in from the town as well. So even though we were a green community, which was great, it was sort of the beginning because when you get funding, everyone gets, you know, happy about that. So, you know, people pay attention when you say, well, there's money to do this project. Um, so that kind of set us set the stage for us to move forward um, to a next level, and we realized that we needed to, you know, start with our baseline and create a new greenhouse gas emissions inventory. And again, the the original inventory was so outdated, we really needed to start fresh. So we had a fellow um, from the University of New Hampshire Sustainability Institute Fellows Program uh, from California come in, um, and spend a summer doing our greenhouse gas emissions inventory, which was great. Um, we have all of his methodology. I can share it with anyone who's interested, um, but it was an ability to give us a place to start and start afresh. Um, and at that point, we knew that we were needing to move towards creating a, a climate action plan again. And so we sort of started through the um, municipal vulnerability programs um, planning grant process, which allowed us to gather community members and stakeholders within the community to identify what the community's vulnerabilities are or were at the time or still are at the time um, uh, to identify those vulnerabilities as they um, pertain to climate change. So things like, for instance, you know, um, flooding, uh, increased heat days, increased storm events, um, infrastructure damage, and those types of things were identified through that process. That was through a series of meetings. That was the beginning of our opportunity to try to look at doing the outreach a little differently. So um, a community member was engaged to help out with um, some of the what we called the information sessions, where community members were invited to come out and sort of talk about all the vulnerabilities um, and all of that information. So we had the sessions with stakeholders that was by invitation. Then we had the community sessions. All of that information was pulled together and we had um, a, a report of findings that was then published. Um, again, anything I mention here, if anyone's interested and you want access, if you don't have it already, let me know and I will get it to you. Um, these would all be helpful to have prior to the retreat. Um, from that process, we moved then to apply for a 2019 MVP implementation grant. Um, the implementation grant is the funding that helped us to develop our climate action plan. So we specifically asked, requested for $100,000 to develop a climate action adaptation and resiliency plan. And that was something that was recommended from the planning grant process. So there had to be some continuity between the planning grant moving into the implementation phase. So development of a CARP was something we identified as being a primary um, driver for moving climate change, uh, addressing climate change within the community. So that process was um, also, again, we engaged a community member to assist with that um, implementation grant as well. We hired a consultant, Linnaean Solutions, for those of you who are not members at the time. Um, they worked with us. We identified in the grant that we wanted to do our outreach in a more equitable way. So we actually formed task groups where we engaged community members to represent um, sectors of the climate action plan again working with our consultant we were able to identify four sectors transportation renewable energy land use and buildings and we then had task groups that were relevant to each of those topics and two ecac members served as the chairs of each of those sector groups and with the consultant, we held a series of three, I think three to four meetings over the course of the summer, uh, spring into summer, and um, were able to sort of narrow in on identifying where we saw um, vulnerabilities, where we saw need for resilience, where we saw need for um, project and action. And all of that information was gathered and 
And that's when you look at the climate action plan, all of that in each of those sectors, basically that work stems from primarily the work of the task groups, but then we also engaged the community at large. We also engaged staff and department heads um, in the municipality as well to contribute to the formation of the projects that are identified in each of those sectors that are in the climate action plan. One, I will add that we also, because of our process, added a, a fifth sector, which was basically governance and communications. And that really stemmed primarily from the whole community engagement piece and the task group process of the need for the community to be engaged in the work that's happening in the town and for the communication to be um, enhanced in a way that was it was accessible to all. So our meetings included interpretation when we had members that needed interpretation. Uh, we did have in the beginning, we had a member who uh, required um, sign language. So we had someone who was able to interpret with sign language. So um, we did our best to address the needs of those members who were engaged in the process. Um, and moving forward, we wanna make sure that in the work that we do, you'll see that equity is a huge piece of our um, a huge uh, priority that's that's infused throughout our climate action plan. Um, and then I will say, then we moved on to um, <clears throat> once we had that um, implementation grant. The one of the first things before we even developed the climate action plan was that we had to go to the the town council and identify our target goals of climate reduction. So we um, proposed the 25% reduction from our greenhouse gas inventory baseline emissions, 25% reduction by 2025, 50% uh, by 2030, and carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, so all of those are, you know, that's kind of built into the climate action plan. However, the only specific strategic projects that are laid out are in the pathway to 2025. The, the idea was that as we move forward and as we move along in this process, there's going to be technologies and opportunities that we aren't even made aware of at this time. So we'll have to reassess and reevaluate and re-identify um, those projects that we need in meeting our next target, our 50% target. So by you know 2025, we should have started developing our pathway for 50% reduction to 2030. So that would be a next phase. And that's something that I would just um, identify for you all to think about as we move forward um, at the retreat and sort of looking at the, the next steps as well. So there are aspirational goals um, and targets that are in the Climate Action Plan. I'm trying to talk fast because I know time's of the essence. So are there any questions? Thank you, um, Stephanie. One thing I do want to say very quickly about the um, community engagement piece is that although we had the task force members invited, um, I will say that it often gets touted as being an example and model of community engagement. And I want to say and be clear with, with us um, that for some people that wasn't the case. Some people that were participating in the process didn't feel that we engaged in quite, um, didn't feel as sort of uh, engaged in a way that, um, they had hoped. And so I just want to put that out there that it's an, it's a model and we learned and there's more we can do. And now the town has um, a DEI coordinator. So we do have um, more of a lens on equity infused in the town now, I think in a way that we didn't have before. And I would say that, you know, our process was certainly one of the first real attempts at trying to make that happen. Yeah, Don. Yeah, Stephanie, is there <clears throat> have you given have has any thought been given to having a, a, at some point a periodic look at inventory again to see how we're doing um visa i mean 2025 isn't all that far away no um, we have um and i think we're going to have a um i'm going to be looking for funding for a fellow uh probably <coughs> excuse me i'm sorry with the sustainability funds um We'll probably want to use some of that to hire a fellow. Um, uh, I would like to have someone if we could get them for next summer, for the summer of 2023. So we would apply in December and then we would have them for 2023. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Stephanie. That was really helpful to get that history. Um, so next we'll go, um, Steve, if you wanted to give, uh, talk a bit about the organization, organizational structure of ECAC, sort of what, what, the next step beyond the CARP, I guess, was like trying to think through how we would organize ourselves. We never quite got there, but um, we're going to this time. Okay, um, we did not include um, a document shared in the agenda packet, did we? Oh yeah, no, you're right, we did not remember. Cool. I think we That's included fine. it in a previous one, but we'll include it in the packet we share with for the retreat. Sure, then what I was, my, my idea, and this will be something to discuss at the retreat, is that our, I think our organization has been good, but I think what I've noticed is that pretty much all national, state, international climate plans refer to several pillars of decarbonation, decarbonization um, strategies. Um, those are electrify everything, increasing energy efficiency, expand renewable energy sources, um, that sort of thing. So I thought it might be helpful for us to organize our efforts and goals under these widely used pillars. Um, and I've heard from people in town and feel myself and sometimes people are like, well, you're doing this, but are you doing that? Are you, are you working on energy efficiency? And it's like, well, yeah, we are, but it's not under one of our current headings. So I proposed um, five headings or five um, head headers, I guess, of what we could do in no particular order. One would be education and outreach. Second would be renewable energy development. Third would be electrification. Fourth would be energy efficiency improvement. And a fifth, re resilient lands and healthy living. And I went back and I looked at our previous notes and minutes and reports, particularly the report we submitted to the town council last year or, or a few months ago and was able to put a bunch of our activities very neatly under these five headings. So education and outreach, that includes the sustainability festival that Stephanie has been doing for years, the block party we did once, uh, newsletters, things we've talked about, uh, websites, scorecards, um, and, and more community education on the clean energy and climate plan. Renewal, under the heading of renewable energy development, that would include the solar study and the bylaw that we're working on. It would also include the community choice that a substantial fraction of our members are working on. Um, the META grant for limited municipal and school PV potentials, um, the this, this study that's going on now and then development of those. Um, the solar project on the North Landfill that falls under the renewable energy development category. And then Dwayne has mentioned um, some interest in solar reparations so that would also be under that category. Electrification, we've, we've talked about it and done various things, increasing the availability of electric car chargers, school bus electrification, um, discouraging fossil fuel infrastructure and in new buildings, um, and commercial residential heat pump promotion. Those would all be electrification initiatives. Then energy efficiency improvements, CPACE is one of those that we've been working on, the Empower Grant and the Rental Building Energy Efficiency Improvement Initiative that um, Andre and I have been working on with RMI and others, LED lighting, um, transitioning the waste hauling system, um, net zero or high standards for the new buildings, the library, the schools and DPW and possibly instituting building energy benchmarking, uh, perhaps as part of the rental efficiency, the rental bylaw. And then finally, the fifth category, resilient lands and healthy living. Um, things that we've done there is the Valley Bike Program, uh, the Mobile Farmers Market, and the Healthy Hampshire Food Justice Initiative, community gardens. Uh, these are things that we have done. Um, things that we could do would be developing local land preservation and, and working lands and enhancing carbon sequestration on those lands and continue with local foods initiative. And then something that we heard during the development of the CARP, local access to nature. So 
not changing much of what we are doing, but just reorganizing it under those common pillars or common strategies that are used in so many of the national and state and international climate action plans. Um, but that, that's my pitch. And I can share a document that outlines that a little bit uh, more detail before the retreat. Yeah, thanks, Steve. That's really helpful. And I think that could be a good basis for some communication and outreach that we do with the community um, as well. So we'll plan on spending um, a bit of time, particularly on our first retreat day, sort of talking about kind of the large, bigger picture organization. And, and so, yeah, we'll dig into that, that more. Does anybody have any clarifications before we move to the next? More of a comment, um, if I may. Yeah, go ahead, Lori. Uh, I just wanna say the only thing I'm not crazy over in those five headings is they don't obviously center social justice. And I mean, they're in there, the things are in there, but I would feel more comfortable if somehow that was worked into at least one of the headings um, so that it's clear it's not just in, it's not just the thread running through, it's also a main um, point of all of this. Anyway. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I have a note here that um, I didn't read just now, but social justice and environmental equity are not typically mentioned as separate pillars, but we need to ensure that they are emphasized in every category or I'm not sure if it be a separate category or somehow we emphasize that they are key threads in every category. Both and. Yes, right. Yeah, that's a good point. That would be a good conversation point to have during the retreat. Okay, great. Um, so now let's move on to some quick updates on some of our current initiatives. Um, we've got renewable energy, CCA, building electrification, CPACE, and educational outreach. So maybe just start with renewable energy and all Duane or, or Stephanie, I think I have listed here, if you wanna speak to anything I guess we kind of talked about the solar study stuff already, so there might not be too much to add, but um, welcome any additional input. Um, I can give an update on the CCA process. Um, we are still working on our MOU contract between the three communities, and it's been reviewed initially uh, by legal for the city of Northampton and the town of Amherst's legal is also covering Pelham as well. They gave us some minor comments and we responded and have sent it back, but we're waiting to hear back from them. So um, if I don't hear anything by tomorrow, I'm going to reach out to the town manager and ask if he can ask them to get feedback. It, at this point, it should be a pretty light lift for them. There wasn't a lot that they addressed. So, And then we would, um, once we get that back and we can get a final version um, that we can distribute to the three communities for signature, then the MOU um, will actually make us an entity that can then sign a contract with the consultant. Then the consultant can actually start getting the whole CCA process moving forward. I wondered if um, people needed a step back to make sure everybody understands CCA. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so, um, do have some slides, but I can't share them. Um, I did just share them with you, Stephanie, if you want to try to find them and bring them up, um, but that might be too much. So um, to understand what community choice aggregation is, you have to first know that um, there's a lot of different names for it. Um, the statute, by law in the state calls it municipal ag aggregation. Um, it's commonly known as community choice aggregation, but also community choice energy. Um, they're all the same thing. And um, we started out um, hoping that it was going to be a much more um, expansive uh, interpretation of the statute, which is a very simple law. Um, there's very little there um, saying what you can and cannot do. And so a lot is up to the Department of Public Utilities um, to control what you can and cannot do. This may change should we get a different governor and a new 
DPU um, leader. So um, there's still some hope that we could use um, this structure to make our, um, yeah, if you just hit um, an arrow, here's the alphabet soup, different names. Just keep going, Stephanie. Okay. And the next slide. Um, so th this is what the different parts of your electricity bill actually are for. Um, there's the supply and then there's the delivery and they both come to you and you pay for them in your bill. Um, the CCA chooses the source. We have representation. We are the ones choosing, um, but the utility still owns the wires, delivers it, the energy, and does the billing. Um, and <clears throat> so the, the, but the money that the um, members of our communities pays goes to the CCA itself. And so in deciding what the rates are, how much um, extra we're going to pay for greener energy. Um, there's some leeway there that uh, allow us to um, express our values as a community. And um, we can use the difference between you know, what's actually paid by customers, what the, the rate that we set and the cost of the supply, that difference allows us to hire a staff person who could, you know, do all, all run, run the whole thing or um, have um, a program that, that could be run through the aggregation. This is tricky right now under um, the current administration, um, but our hope is that more and more that kind of program could be done through the fees that are collected um, based on being the, a part of the, the revenue stream. Um, next slide. Can, um, I, can I ask a question? Yes. I'm, I'm still confused as to how this is structured. So the, um, the, the CCA is going to be buying the energy or because right now we can pick whichever we, it's the same thing for each of us, right? We get to pick who we're sourcing, who, who we buy the energy from, but it's delivered by every source, no matter what, right? And we pay based on who we choose as our supplier. Yes. Um, so the CCA buy the energy in bulk, therefore providing some savings on both the delivery and the and the cost of the energy, or not on the delivery. Yeah, just on the energy. Just on the sourcing. Okay. So buying that in bulk and maybe there'll be some relief there then um well it, yes it, it, it's um always a desire of an aggregation to um save customers money um yeah. but they don't often um we've looked at the data and it's about 50 50 it's a okay. little bit over 50 percent um so the difference is that rate. So the difference is that presumably you're buying greener energy and trying to phase it in over time. But right now I can pick a place that's 100% green and pay for that, which is what I try to do. Now, I'm not sure they're lying to me when they say this. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, is that the issue? Because I, I'm trying to yes. see. Okay. Yes. And it's definitely, you know, green. <laughs> then, then you don't have that, that question. Um, but we don't want to go down the rabbit hole of is the supply actually green that I'm buying from my third party um, provider because that is a whole hour conversation. But I'd be happy to have it with you. But the big the big um, breakthrough, if you will, with this municipal aggregation legislation is that it enabled a town with permission from DPU to aggregate all their customers um, in in their town. And buy and and uh, and provide them with with a, a common um, electric retail supplier to meet everybody 
buy, try to buy bulk and meet everybody and everybody's automatically part of it unless they opt out. Right. Um, and so it, it enables well, uh, opt, uh, aggregation of, of a larger yeah. customer base. Yeah. So it, Stephanie, you can go ahead. It, it started when um, Massachusetts deregulated. Just keep going, um, Stephanie. And um, keep going. On your bill, you can see if you look at it, there's the delivery part, there's the supply part. You can keep, skip through these. This is the law. This is like half of the law. Go ahead, Stephanie. We're not going to go through this or this. Okay, but this is um, just to have it in your mind. Our original goal was to improve on what was normally being done in um, aggregations in Massachusetts and make it more like the California aggregations, which have a lot more freedom um, to add on things. And so ideally we get to do this in a couple of years when the um, DPU is run by people who actually want to use this tool to reduce carbon emissions. Next slide. So yes, you can just keep on getting. We started with residents. We brought on Duane and River at UMass Clean Energy Extension and formed the, and then the officials made it official. Um, and then the last to join was the, um, one more uh, click, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, and for two years, we, we all met and, and made, made the plans. Um, now it is a staff group. It's just the um, representatives, official representatives from the different um, towns. And the, the original residents um, participate actively in supporting the staff. So I think that uh, this is the process we've gone through. We researched, um, we got authorization from each of the municipalities to develop a plan. Um, and now we are about to hire a consultant who will um, put that plan in that, that we've already developed a, a version of, we'll make it a, um, something that they believe the um, DPU will, uh, you, can, you can do the next one, the DPU will approve. Um, and then that could take a while, but keep going, please. Um, once the DPU approves it, then we can start with um, hiring, not hiring, but co contracting for the supply. Go ahead, Stephanie Moore. And, um, and actually, you know, doing the outreach and having the opt out period, and then beginning to provide the electricity for all of our community members. Okay, that's it. You can you can go you can stop sharing. You can stop sharing, Stephanie. Did it. Thanks, Andra. Um yeah, so I think during the retreat it'd be great to talk through we sort of always talk about CCA as part of our sort of portfolio of things that we're trying to move forward and be great to think through some like tangible actions of, of what we what we could do there um, and sort of the timing of when that would be. Um, any other, anything else you wanna add Dwayne around CCA or renewables or, or energy before we move on to building electrification? Um, nope, I'm good. Okay, great. Um, okay, so the next up is is building electrification. Um, I know we talked a little bit about it, I think before I joined, we were talking about it, but 
Um, Steve, I don't know if you want to give a little bit of an overview of just what REM or, or Andra, what REI has been, REI, RMI, Rocky Mountain Institute, formerly known as, has been um, and doing. We talked a bit about it last time, but maybe just a quick overview would be great. Sure, I can say a few things. Um, we started working with RMI, Rocky Mountain Institute, oh, I think it's almost two years ago now. And the first areas that we were working with was, I think we attended some workshops on electrification, which is a thing that a couple of towns in Eastern Mass have been trying to do. And that includes local regulation to prohibit fossil fuel infrastructure in new buildings. That is ongoing. We are not focusing on that so much directly, but an offshoot of that was looking at energy use in rental buildings. And Amherst, like some other communities, has very high rate of renters, something like 55 or 57 percent of Amherst residents are renters. And so I think that's something that we learned in part during the CARP process and recognize that there's a so-called split incentive there where the building owners don't have incentive to increase the energy efficiency of their buildings because in most cases, the tenants are paying the energy bills directly. Um, so we've recognized this need and we've been working with RMI since for the last, at least the last year to address that issue. And we've been making some progress. We've, we've talked about different ways that this could be um, implemented. And we have gotten a grant, and that is the Empower grant. Is that right, Stephanie? Yeah, that is going to help us work with local renters advocacy groups. Um, and so that will allow us to, working with them and some local community groups, learn what renters want and need, and also do some basic information like how many, what percentage of renters actually do pay their own utility bills. We think it's a high percentage, but we don't know. Um, so that, that's one development. That was a grant that um, we put together last year. So that's moving forward. The other thrust has been to try to understand our rental housing stock better. And so we've been working with the town of Amherst to collect data from two different universes, it turns out. <laughs> One is the database that's associated with the rental permits that every rental um, property owner has to get each year. Um, and that's the, the bylaw that was passed, I don't know, maybe seven, eight, 10 years ago, the one that we were talking about earlier that's being updated. Um, there's some information collected there for each of those. Primarily, it's the number of uh, rental units on a parcel. A parcel may be a single house that could be a two family house. It may be a parcel that has two or three different buildings, each a single family or perhaps some two families or a parcel could be a place like presidential apartment complexes or um, some of the others where there might be 15 or 20 buildings. So the number of rental units on a parcel can range from one to 200 or more. Um, so that's information on the rental property registration permit. The other universe is the um, property cards that are associated with the assessor's office. And we are really hoping to be able to combine that because the property cards list information like when the building, what year the building was built, the heating source, the fuel type, whether there's air conditioning or not, um, the exterior cladding, the wall type. So information that would really help us get down into the energy efficiency of different buildings. The problem is, and this is my new update, um, we're looking at that data and just last week I was looking at it and working with the team from RMI. What we were able to get from the town, unfortunately, is not including a lot of the details for the bigger properties. So Puffton Village, for example, there's three parcels and something like 30 different property cards um, spread out across that. None of the detailed information for Puffton Village came through on those property cards. Mm. And that's same true for um, uh, presidential and a couple of the others that I cross-checked with the property cards that you can look at the publicly available online. So we, um, st I still want to connect. I haven't had a chance to connect with uh, our coach, Cora, and uh, members from the RMI team about how to proceed. 
I think we're going to have to probably settle for a slightly less sophisticated analysis of our housing stock, which we can do with the data. And that will be the number of units. We can probably get building age for the different buildings, uh, the number of units and that sort of thing. So we'll, we're working on that. And that'll help us figure out how to best, um, what kind of mechanisms we might employ to help stimulate energy efficiency improvements by the building owners. Um, can I just add as part of that process where um, for the um, rental outreach piece, we are working with uh, Family Outreach of Amherst um, as our partner in this effort, and they've uh, been great so far. They're going to be the ones that will essentially um, help identifying uh, team captains from various uh, apartment complexes in town, and those folks will help create and distribute the survey to gather the rental data information as to what's important to renters. So um, that information will all be collected and at the end of that process um, put together to compile a report that will help then inform um, maybe the, uh, you know, the development of our rental disclosure, uh, rental building disclosure policy for energy yeah, efficiency, right. sorry. Bethany, what was the name of that family outreach? Family outreach. Of Amherst or something? Of Amherst, like? yep. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Dwayne. Yeah, Steve, just remind me um, in terms of the, uh, particularly I'm thinking of the apartment complexes and I do get the um, issues with the complexity of the data, uh, which is never easy. Um, but I'm wondering in terms of uh, the ultimate goal uh, you talked to with regard to um, trying to help figure out ways to improve the, the building and energy efficiency um, is the is the goal also to really uh, you know maybe it's an, another step up but to also at least begin conversations with them about electrification of those buildings as well or is that is that sort of too large too large of a stretch you think at this at this point I yeah it's sort of my question there. Yeah, that, that's certainly a goal. And the idea, the dream, I guess, is that we could entice more building owners to go through and do deep energy retrofits that includes air sealing, insulation, and electrification. And I just read a really good story, um, and I can't remember where it was located, but I think it was in Massachusetts. A fairly large property owner went through and did that on some of their properties and learned a lot. Um, they added a lot of solar and it turned out it was really complicated because there were multiple meters and the solar interconnect laws didn't really work with that. And so the article describes how the building owners and um, I think folks from DOER or EEA, some of the state agencies and the utilities went through and hashed out a lot of these issues about how can you go install solar on units where there are multiple meters. And they're hoping that that will become sort of a template or at least a pathway better defined for other places to go forward. So yeah, the ultimate goal would be to, through structures like CPACE, the financing structure could entice owners to do that. And I'm hoping that we might find some local property owners that would be willing to go through the process and um, help identify those paths and then document it in a way that other building owners could follow. Um, that's the longer term goal. I think, well, that's, that's ongoing goal. The, the more immediate goal might be things like to, the part of the rental, the new registration, rental property registration bylaw would be to have energy use disclosures. Okay. Mm -hmm. So property owners would have to disclose the, the costs of utilities, heating, cooling, um, water um, to potential renters. And, and then perhaps also a rating system um, and that would be a way to allow us to collect data for a few years, and then we might be able to start setting some standards and buildings that don't meet a certain energy efficiency rating would have to think of a way to incentivize yeah. them to improve their ratings. And there are some examples of places in other states, other communities yeah. that have done this sort of thing. Um, 
both through incentives as well as through regulations. Like in theory, you could say you can't have a rental permit if your building doesn't meet a certain level of energy efficiency. So those are the ideas that we're looking at. And, um, but learning more about what the housing stock is like, um, you know, what percentage of our buildings are pre-1950 and how many were built in the 70s where they didn't bother with insulation, and how many are been built since the 90s that might be pretty good. That, that's, you gotta figure that out. Great. Yeah, that leads nicely into um, CPACE, which I have the slides on it, but I don't think we need to pull them up. We'll just share them for the interest of time. But CPACE or com commercial PACE um, is a financing mechanism that allows community property owners to finance energy improvements for existing buildings over a long term. So towns in Massachusetts, this is a program that got started in 2020. Um, towns in Massachusetts opt in. And if you opt in, then building owners in your communities can access this financing. Um, it, it says here to to finance energy improvements through PACE Massachusetts, a property owner agrees to a betterment assessment and lien on their property, which repays the financing. Um, so this approach enables owners to undertake more comprehensive energy upgrades with long, longer payback periods up to 20 years. And it also notes that if a property sells, the assessment stays with the property and is transferred to the subsequent property owner. So you don't need to be owning the property for a long time you know, a long time, which is, I know, sometimes limitation. Um, so properties that are eligible for financing through this PACE program are commercial buildings, industrial buildings, multifamily buildings with five or more units, or buildings owned by nonprofit organizations. And the improvements that are eligible um, are energy efficiency upgrades, renewable energy, and then this last one, which is not a good one, which is extension of existing natural gas distribution to a property. <laughs> um, so we would want to discourage that. Um, there's been, the first project funded through CPACE actually was just this past September, um, and it was a building in Greenfield, or it is a building in Greenfield. Um, and so through PACE Massachusetts, capital provider Greenworks Lending will provide financing for a range of energy upgrades um, that were installed to this building, which is like an office building. Um, efficient electrification of space heating, energy recovery, ventilation, LED lighting and controlling, improvements to windows and installations and solar on the roof. Um, so I think this is, I think the problem we've seen with this, and we've talked about it a little bit already, is that there's not a lot of communication material. So there's really not much, there's like nothing. I think Don, you even mentioned like, do they have flyers on the website? As far as I can tell, they don't. So I think one thing we should do is probably reach out to Mass Development, who's running the program and ask them, are they planning on doing more communications? I realize all this was launched during COVID. So maybe that has something to do with it. But I think um, it's clear to me that if there's a ton of, towns opted in so it's clear to me that if only one program has been funded so far that there's not they're not getting the word out so I think there's work we could do there to either do our own communication materials or see if they're preparing to do some um, and then I think we talked about potentially collecting like a list of eligible building owners and starting to get the word out directly um, and then maybe also you know, we can't extend natural gas in Amherst because we have a moratorium. So that's not even an option for us. So figuring out how to build in the electrification, which I will give an update on because we just got a heat pump for our house and the first month. So we were operating an oil furnace that wasn't working very well. So we had a lot of space heaters. <laughs> now we have a heat pump that was less expensive with rebates than replacing the oil furnace. And we used less electricity last month total than the month before when we were still heating with oil. So it's the future, um, even in a cold climate. Anyway, um, so with that, I will <laughs> jump off my soapbox, but it was hard and you have to have credit to get the, like there's a zero interest loan, but you have to have credit to get that. And so it's not, 
it's not accessible to everybody. So there are still many problems with the issue with the program. Yeah, Lori. Yeah, Laura, I just wanted to echo, I'm now trying to do something similar in my house and have been trying since November and only this week realized just how difficult it is to even apply for those 0% loans um, and how much it's going to set me back in time as well. Uh, now that I finally have a quote that I like um, after yeah. six months of trying. Uh, so so um, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite a process. You have to wonder how anybody gets it done. So that brings me back to this idea of CPACE. So now having seen this Ithaca presentation, I realized that um, what block power is doing is what CPACE does to some extent, only they, it comes with all the bells and whistles because they do the outreach and sign people up. Um, mm -hmm. So here we have the financing available that sounds awfully similar to what block power does, but we have to go out and do the, you know, let's get a list of people, see where the low hanging fruit is, get the ones who want to sign up for this awesome deal to sign up for it. Um, it looks like that's sort of left to us. Maybe that's a big part of what we should be doing if that's really how this is going to work. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, it's Wayne. I think that's a great point. Um, and maybe it's, you know, a role that we can play is sort of that packaging it up or tr we're trying to find some funds to get to, or through the CCA to uh, package package something up like this. But I, I guess my uh, the question I had just to confirm um, in terms of eligibility for CPACE, uh, you mentioned renewable energy and energy efficiency. And it's not, a, it's, 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 uh, depending on how those are defined, are, is electrification included in that? Yeah, that, that was my question as well. I mean, it does, it did say in the press release about the Greenfield project that it included efficient electrification of space heating. I don't know, that terminology is a little strange, so I don't know exactly what that means, but we could probably reach out to the owners of the um, Greenfield spot and just like ask <laughs> what that means. Um, but yeah, I agree with that, Dwayne. I think that that's, and then the inclusion of the natural gas thing makes me wonder, because I know there has been some issues in the past with mass save and stuff sort of leaning, moving people more towards natural gas than towards electrification. So we should figure that out. Um, okay, in interest of time, I'm gonna maybe give the last five minutes to Vasu if he wants to say anything about educational plans and then we will go back to our vote before we close up. Yeah, I, was, I think about three months ago, I was trying to put a structure oh, to the your, map. Your, your voice is weird again. <laughs> it's a little robot -y. That always happens. How, how about now? Uh, still a little bit, yeah. Gravelly. <laughs> One more time. I think that's good. Okay. Yeah. I, no, I was just saying, you know, I was trying to put a structure to the madness, the amount of effort that we all put in. Um, so we, I came up with a community engagement timeline with thoughts around how, what an education series that we can have, um, you know, what's, what are our goals and does, does the community know more about our goals and then, you know, creating some sort of a dashboard and presenting that to the community so they're actively engaged. So, um, you know, I think this is where I can tap into Steve's expansive network and try to get some engagement from the community as well. Great. Yeah. And so we'll include your, so anybody with slides or documents, um, let's make sure we include them all together in, in sort of our um, retreat packet. So we have that ahead of our, of our retreat and a couple ideas have popped up just in this conversation about things we want to cover. But if through this discussion, you have questions, like now that, that it's fresh in your mind, like if you want to throw out any questions to me or Stephanie, that you have or ideas that you wanna make sure we talk about at the retreat based on all this information, go ahead and throw them our way and we'll pull that together um, for the retreat. Uh, um, Cause we know it, it's a couple, I know I forget things. So, um, so yeah, so, and any other additional agenda items and we'll make sure that we um, have all that together. So I think the time, Stephanie, if, remind me of the timing we agreed to. I think I have it written down. 
somewhere. Um, uh, we were going to skip the meeting on the 20th because that was school vacation week. Yes, I will not, I, I'll not be here. Um, so it was the two dates after that, May, oh, my glasses, um, May 4th and, does that sound right? No, May 11th. May 4th and May 11th. I think we had them as two consecutive meetings. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So um, I think we do have, oh no, okay. So that will be our next meeting will be May 4th and that will be our first retreat where we'll focus on sort of the big picture items. And then the next day, the next week, we will um, go into more detail on specific projects and, and moving those forward. Um, okay, great. So with that, I think let's go back, I guess, to the solar. Um, thank you. First of all, thank you all for preparing stuff and going through that overview. I know it's a lot of information, but I think it's really helpful for all of us to be on the same page. Um, all right, so Stephanie, I'll turn it back over to you for the voting. Sure. Um, Andra, can you turn your um, camera back on just so I have you? Because I can't even see you at all in, right now. Thanks. All right, so, um, so we have two uh, parties interested in being on the solar bylaw working group. And so I first, I guess, need a show of hands. Um, I guess I don't know if we need a motion. That's, I'm sorry, I just suddenly got confused as to whether we need a motion to nominate a specific person and then we vote and then do another vote. Does that sound right? I'll, I'm not, we can I'm not motion about that. We move that we nominate both Dwayne and Steve. <laughs> well, we, if we, so here's the thing. If we nominate them both, and then we both have an issue them. of like having a little subcommittee, which we can't do. No, no, so no, I think vote on them separately, but nominate them both. Yeah, so we can vote oh, on yes. Them. Vote, yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I guess I'll start with Steve because he's the first one in my line of vision. So, um, so I guess I will give, you'll have to give me a voice vote. So um, I will go around and ask each of you uh, if you have an intent to vote for Steve. So remember, you can only vote for one. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so I'll start with. Can Gopher. we just? Oh, sorry, Stephanie. Can we just say who we vote like between Dwayne and Steve? Who we sure, vote for? Sure, we could do it that okay. way. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, I just need to keep track. So, um, Goldner. <laughs> sorry. Like first. So I, I really think either of you could do this, um, and I but I'm going to vote for Dwayne. Um, okay, Allison. You're muted. You're muted and sorry about that, Steve. Okay. Roof. I'm gonna vote for Dwayne. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was gonna happen. Okay. Dwayne? <laughs> Gregor? I don't know. I guess I'll vote for myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Stella? <laughs> Uh, I'll vote for, for Dwayne. <laughs> okay. Ragavan? It's easier for everybody. <laughs> no, no, I'm wrestling conscious here, right? Um, I'll vote for Dwayne as well. Drucker? Yeah, I'm going to vote for Steve. And Rose. Hey. All right. Well, we have... Six for Gregor and two for Ruth. But Steve, sometime I really want to talk to you about the Rocky Mountain Institute. <laughs> I, 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 um, I just, it's not comfortable to vote like this. And it's like, we always, we always, uh, I think our, all of our votes are usually unanimous. So uh, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's not a pleasurable thing, but I appreciate everybody's support. I will represent us well. And, uh, and, and Steve, I, I, I really appreciate and respect your um, not only interest and passion, but expertise uh, in this area. So I look forward to, to uh, connecting with you uh, over coffee or, something, or whatever, however we have to do that. Yeah, Steve, yeah. you're not off the hook anyway. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you, if, if 
Dwayne doesn't come to you, I will be as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I want to stay involved and um, you know, perhaps this way I might be able to be a little bit more involved with the solar assessment. And as we are con went through our list of current initiatives, I realized I was involved in a fair number of things. So I, I almost withdrew my name before the vote there. But um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to um, seeing you on the front lines, Dwayne, and I'll be helping you from the uh, back table of the coffee shop there. <laughs> All right. Great. Um, okay, let's see if we have one any... public attendee. Okay. Um, if anyone in the public uh, would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. Okay, uh, I don't see Lydia raising her hand. So um, thank you all for this informative meeting and um, yeah, looking forward to, to our retreats. And please send me your slides or any other packet information as I'll have to assemble all of that. Um, if it gets too big, we're probably gonna have to share it by, um, I'll send you a, a link to a OneDrive folder. I think that's probably how we're gonna have to do this. Okay, great. Um, and if anybody has any like suggestions on, ha has been to any virtual retreats re recently and has any suggestions for things we can do, um, I know we're a little bit limited with games. our technology, but um, like, you know, like games we can play. Yeah, we can or play like games. different ways. I like wood squares. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> we just can't do breakout. I mean, that's the thing. The limitation is, you know, the main major one is we cannot do breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. um, we're able to do Stephanie like jam jam boards. I They're like think so. Okay, I, I don't. I mean, I'll have to double check though. I don't know. I would think we can do something like that. Okay. Yeah, um, just be like a way to like collect notes as we're talking yeah. so that um, we, yeah, we can share them afterwards with in a packet or something so they're public, but. We can't, yeah, we can't have a chat function going. We're okay. not allowed to have the chat function. We're not allowed to have breakout rooms. Um, but other than that, anything that public can see. Yeah, I guess that's the question with the jam board of whether the public would see it they would need the mm. link to it as well okay maybe we could put the link in the agenda though mm -hmm. right yeah. if we did that would that be or is it... i don't know i'll ask or it could be or maybe maybe some one of us could share the screen of the jam board well yeah. that's what oh, i was yeah. going to say if we could yeah. do that's something like idea. that yeah okay i'll think on it a little bit and if anybody has any other suggestions um ping them to stephanie and i and we'll see if they're doable um, <laughs> I can reach out to IT too and see what's possible. Okay, that'd be great. Um, okay, well, great. Uh, everybody enjoy um, the rest of your week and we'll talk soon. Thanks Bye everyone, all. have a good night. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.